So now we are back with some technical improvements and uh, we on this third day of our Gyan one week course, we delivered two lectures, one by the foreign faculty, Professor Miwa Kosuda, and the second one by the host faculty, me, Muhammad Akram. And now uh, I'm very sure that the participants are having interesting questions. So now one by one, the participants can ask the questions and we are here to respond. You must ask questions to Professor Miwa Kosuda first, and then my turn will come next. Yes, please, you can start. Unmute yourself and ask your questions. Hello. Mm -hmm. Don't we have any question? No, sir. Sir, I have a question. Um, Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, I'll take your question. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, my question is, uh, when we are talking about the, the cancer care and how we can make a difference, in, in when we talk about India, the patient load is so high that just attending to the biomedical model and looking at the disease itself, doctors and other staff have no time. And to attend to the illness part and to take uh, care of the other needs of the patients, it is not usually possible in the India setup. I was trying to understand how does Japan work and address these issues in the uh, field level, in the hospital level, how do they address this? I thank you very much for your question. Uh, as I uh, talk during my lecture, you know, of course it is really necessary for the cancer patient to see the medical doctor and to get uh, medical treatment. However, it is also important to participate in society uh -huh. if they have the illness and the disability and to have the, you know, the peer support and um, thus to create a good communication and relationship with others so which all can be said, social capital. So I'm a sociologist and I'm talking about the social aspect of health. So uh, to answer your question, even if there are some, the, uh, the medical care and medical professional are limited, there are many ways to support cancer patient, even you, the people, ordinary people, and the family, and the neighbor, and the person in the community can support the patient. And as I showed the data of Japanese cancer patient, they need uh, the medical treatment and the development of the medical um you know, research. However, at the same time, they need the place to uh, consult the, the anxiety and to uh, have the, you know, the with others to associate with their anxiety and loneliness. So I recommend you to be the good friend of the you know, the patient and uh, not to see the patient as just a miserable person, but the independent and respectable person and try to make the social environment for the patient to live with the dignity. So it is my answer. Do you understand? 
Do you understand? Yes, madam. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Okay. Uh, what's your name? Who asked the question? Sir, sir my name is Tej, sir. Tej. So, Tej, uh, basically, you wanted to know how can we develop healthcare facilities for the cancer patient in India, right? And you wanted to take the insight from Japan, right? Yes, uh, from the from the the other needs, not the bio uh, the biomedical needs from the, for the other needs. Right, right, right. So see, there are two three important things that we can also add on this. See, when you are talking about cancer, you need to understand the causation of cancer. That trajectory is very important, right? Because if the patients of cancer keep on increasing, then no matter what kind of health infrastructure you have developed, there will be huge burden on this. Now, keeping in mind the kind of country that we are in India, we are a hugely populated country. So the burden will keep on increasing. One very important intervention here would be to decrease the prevalence or the causation of cancer. That means to take into consideration the preventive aspect. Because the clinical aspect is very clear. The treatment aspect is very clear. But we need to basically address the spread aspect, the causation aspect. I would like to talk a few words about the causation of cancer, the carcinogenic forces, right? See, what is happening, the food additives that we have been using massively, that is one of the important factors of causation of cancer. The sedentary lifestyle is also definitely playing a role in causation of cancer. Then the kind of the pollution that we are witnessing, nobody can say which of these factors is solely responsible, but a combination of these factors are definitely responsible. So simultaneously, we also need to go for the preventive aspects and that is again very interesting, very important. So when you want to control a specific disease, it is not just the clinical dimension of the problem or the medicinal aspect of the problem. It is also the, the preventive aspect of the problem. And social capital does play a very important role in execution of the preventive aspect of the problem. So the role of social capital needs to be seen not only in the context of the clinical dimensions of the problem, but also in the preventive aspects of the problem. See, during the COVID, for example, this social capital does play, did play a very important role and in the preventive aspect, right? So whenever you look at any disease, you examine it not only from the clinical perspective, but also from the preventive perspective. The intervention made by social sciences is primarily to address the prevention aspect also, right? So now we can have next question to Professor Miwaku. This one participant named Akhtar Hussain. He did a research on cancer, prevalence of cancer. Akhtar Hussain, are you here? Yes, sir. So, Akhtar, I was expecting that you will make it very productive because of your primary study on cancer. So, what kind of question you are having? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I, 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 I was about to ask about from uh, Professor Hosoda. And that was uh, in her presentation. Uh, the uh, data was uh, very well presented uh, through slides. But in one of the slides, uh, titled Annual Trends in Deaths by Cause of Death. Uh, by Cause of Death. She referred to cancer as the major cause of death. But when we look into the figures provided by International Agency for Cancer, uh, for research on cancer that says heart, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, 
uh, as the major cause of death does uh, the uh, data in the presentation refer to only japan or it refers to other parts of the world is it japan specific slide yeah only japan oh, okay only japan okay thank you ma'am and second thing i wanted to know from the you uh, ma'am uh, as we talk as uh, uh, mr tej also referred to the uh, uh, yeah uh, professor akram also referred to the preventive and causative trajectories i also wanted to know from the side of you as uh, this thing was missing from your presentation ma'am about the risk factors of cancer as and also the preventive measures of cancer as these are the two important factors through which we can reduce the increasing burden of cancer and simultaneously we can have a reduction in the burden on, in on healthcare system whether it's medical system or it is uh, allopathic or homeopathic or whatever so this thing was missing from uh, your presentation ma'am and in that regard i want to know from the side of you based on your experience based on your research that what could be the possible risk factors specific to cancer causation and how could we prevent cancer and what would be the most important measures uh, be, um, uh, that through which we can uh, prevent the cancer from occurring and Simon, this I think this question is already answered. But it is bold. You can ask next question after yes. getting the answer. Don't ask too many questions. But, but this this question is already answered, sir. Uh, both of by both of you. But and another thing I wanted to know from researchers' point of view that is, as researchers, especially those dealing with some life-threatening disease like cancer, we face many issues while we extract information while we interact with these afflicted people like patient is not interested or they are not in ready to share their experiences and uh, i want to know from both of you what are the best ways to get the, these people share their experiences as as i have why i'm asking this I, I have faced these issues while dealing while talking to these cancer patients in during my field work and what could be the best ways to get the best information, to get the needful required data or information from these patients, or what could be the best ways to get them share their experiences with a researcher. This is what I wanted to know. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your question. I think maybe uh, the, the mainly two questions. So how to prevent the cancer and how to share the, the experience for the uh, the patient. So the first one, how to prevent cancer? It is really um, hard question. However, um, if we see the you know how how the, the cause of the cancer, there are various factor like even the you know uh, the you know radiation in the natural uh, environment. So it caused the cancer, and also uh, the eating habit and uh, to to take intake take the you know um uh, the fish con sometimes contain the hazardous uh, contain uh you know the the factor, but it is said as you know the uh the tobacco like a smoking is very harmful and to gain the the, the, you know, the cause to the lung cancer. So the thing we can do is uh, anti-tobacco movement and not to smoke. This is very important to protect. <laughs> So, so in the public health area, the anti-tobacco uh, control, tobacco control is one of the huge topic. And um, how about in India? <laughs> so the tobacco and consumption is decreasing. So, uh, so this is my question. Of course, there are many ways to prevent the cancer. Uh, but um, it is that you know that the tobacco control is considered the 
you know, the huge role in that intervention. And next one is the how to share the experience of the patient. So remember I told you about the peer support. So peer support is basically uh, the, the people who had the same illness and disability create an association or organization and uh, to and there they you know, support each other. And also that people without uh, disability and in illness <laughs> can participate in that you know, group. So um, people can share in such group and the peer support is now currently uh, considered uh, to play a very important role uh, to promote the health. For example, uh, in Japan, uh, there are many patient groups and peer support groups, and they share their experience with each other. And I'm very curious about in India, are there any such kind of the patient groups and they have the peer support activities. So if somebody knows about this, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. So are, are there such kind of uh, peer support in India? Cancer peer support or, or stroke peer support? Uh, as such, ma'am, if I share some fieldwork experience, I got to know. Uh, um, was like I was in a hospital uh, during my fieldwork. I could know, I, I came to know that doctors were allopathic, mostly dealing with allopathic system of treatment. They, they give a lot of support to their patients. As I have seen, uh, I, 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 have, I have noticed you, 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 that they give, like what we call that, uh, I, I'm, I'm not getting this uh, thing. Uh, uh, they, they, they give psychological support. They suggest different things. They suggest uh, different um, um, help, helpful things to the patient. Uh, I think uh, uh, those things help patients to get uh, to feel some relief from their uh, pain, like these things. Okay, thank you very much. So, doctor, take care of patient. As also some of the patients also shared with me that they got a support from their peers, like mm -hmm. whether their caregivers or their uh, co-patients co that suffering from the same disease. Like one of the, my patients said that when I was in hospital, when I was hospitalized, one of the patients told me that you will face this, you will face this, you will face this, and simultaneously you will have some benefits also. And in that way, I think that there is, uh, to some extent, care, uh, peer support is, to some extent, there existing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Let me add one or two things over here. Basically, again, we are <laughs> India. Basically, we are a huge country. We have different states. We have different uh, geographies, and there are different cultural dimensions also. So, whatever is existing. Yes. One cultural settings yes. is not necessarily existing in the, in the other part of the yes. for example yes, in Kerala, varies uh, from context uh, context in Kerala, there is a huge uh, rise or growth of palliative care right and now basically yes, the sir. ill people they are getting lots of palliative care in Kerala but can we say the same thing about the other states uh, perhaps no because nothing not at all upon, that will depend upon the specific states also so yes we cannot make any generalization in the just yes sir, yes, yes, uh, sir. definitely Professor Miwako, uh, in the previous lecture when i was talking about the the spread of communicable and non communicable disease in india then actually i shared slides and talked about that in the government has basically classified or grouped the indian states in three categories one category of includes eight states are those yes. where the health indicators are actually poor. 
Then the other, there is a one a geography a specific region that they have some kind of spatial limitations also. That is the second category. And the third category is basically the other states, that is the major states, or you can say the comparatively better states. Yes, sir. We will see. Uh, Akhtar, please don't say. Uh, so what when you will see the health indicators in these three groups of states, you'll find that that they are drastically different. Drastically different. We were talking about life expectancy in some of the states in India as of now, the life is around 79 to 80, whereas in some of the states it is 68 or 67 years. That is within the country, there is a huge uh, disparity is existing, and that is applicable to almost each and every dimension related to healthcare or even uh, the prevalence of disease. That kind of diversity is existing very much here, right? So the participants who want to respond, they need to talk about whatever they have observed in that specific geography or in that specific locality, right? Because this is how we collect the empirical experiences. So now uh, I have an, an important announcement to make here. Today we are going to have six, seven presentations prepared by the participants. So if there is no more question from Professor Miwako or me, then we will start the presentation of the participants. Do we have any more questions? So a simple explanation I want to know from you, sir. In your presentation, you talked about increasing life expectancy, sir. And uh, I, I want to know, do you take this increasing life expectancy as a positive change? Because we see that like, increasing life expectancy is regarded as one of the causes of uh, uh, different life-threatening diseases, especially when we talk about cancer. How, what are your observations about this, sir? Okay, okay, after I'm responding to this question, this is an important one. If you remember the last slide where we discussed almost 10 minutes, that was basically daily, that is disability adjusted life years, right? Do you remember that, Akhtar? So, yes, sir. Basically, when we are talking about life expectancy, simultaneously, we also need to talk about whether that life span is free from disease or morbidities or to what extent that life span is free from morbidities or disease. And that is why we talked about the concept of daily, that is the disability adjusted life years, right? Yes. We also talked about the short-term dis disability and the long-term disability. So if these, th these two things are increasing simultaneously, life expectancy is increasing, and along with that, that daily is also increasing. Daily that to the long-term disability and this life is also increasing, then somehow this growth is actually compromised. Hmm. So what we are intending to look is that a life expectancy increase, but that should be a healthy life expectancy. Hmm. It should be a disability adjusted kind of thing, right? That means we, have, we are having twin goals. One, increase the life expectancy. Life. And simultaneously, we should have control over the prevalence of morbidities as well as mortalities. Mm -hmm. Control over mortality is one aspect of the problem. And control over the morbidities is another important aspect of the problem. And that is why we talked about this communicable and non-communicable diseases. And that is why I focused on that disability adjusted life. Yes, right. I hope you got my answer, Akhtar. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Majman. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Majman, sir. Good. So, any quick question? Otherwise, who is going to present first? Should I read out the names? Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so as you talked about the preventive aspects, the preventive aspects is important. So can we say that if we change our lifestyles, it may not be affected in a life long run? Or because we couldn't escape our life, uh, life or lifestyles from adulteration or any kind of adulteration? See, can you uh, rephrase uh, your question to make it more sharp? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. 
change our lifestyles it may be affected in a uh, long run because we could not escape our lifestyles from adulteration or in any kind of adulteration because uh, in food adulteration or radiation exist in our life it may create carcinogenic diseases so we yeah. if we change our lifestyles it helpful in a long, long run yes see there are two or three dimensions basically it is not just about the lifestyle see if there is no control or say control of the government over those mal practices which result into producing those kind of uh, food additives right which may become yes. xenogenic then that is a huge problem it is not related to the life standard it is related to the governance issue right food uh, can i answer yeah 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 yes ma'am yes yeah uh, thank you very much uh, such a good question so please remember the rainbow model of social determinants of health so if you remind the social determinant of health there are various uh, factors to protect health so lifestyle is one of them and also uh, the place to live and how to work and also, as uh, the professor Akram said, the, the health system is also one of the factors. And environmental, you know, surrounding environment is also affected your health. So to prevent the disease and to, you know, have the long life expectancy, all these various kind of factors are uh, influenced. So, uh, lifestyle, you know, you change the lifestyle to, um, you know, for protecting health. It is a really good thing, but there are another thing. So, to um, understand the comprehensive and the integrated way to protect the health, you know, as a consequence, the life expectancy is getting longer and you will have the healthy life. So, that is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Who, who had asked this question? Uh, sir, Nusrat Fidoz. Okay. So, uh, Nusrat, you got the answer of your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Anybody else? No. Just a, just a quick, just a quick question, uh, Tulika here. Um, yes. So, uh, Professor, Professor Mihako, I so I was looking at, I mean, hearing your presentation. So there is one thing uh, that when we think about cancer treatment, often it requires multiple doctors, right? Uh, because it comes up with other kind of diseases, like secondary diseases. So what kind of model is available there in terms of having a team of doctors who can, uh, you know, give the comprehensive treatment to the cancer patient because often what we experience in India that you have to literally run around from the oncologist to say if it is in a particular body part to that expert. So so what is your understanding about it? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you mean uh, the, how it that is why the team-based medicine and the interdisciplinary yes. collaboration is really important. You know, before uh, the sectionalism of the medical professionals and expertise of the professionals, they focus on very narrow uh, way to cure the patient. However, now, the holistic approach to the patient is uh, one of the big challenge. So yeah, the the you know the the medical doctor uh, collaborate with some other discipline like a palliative care and the psychologist and the social social worker. It is yeah now important. So the to implement the concept of team medical care or interdisciplinary collaboration is one of the key to to solve this uh, problem. I... Is it okay? 
Sulika, is it okay? Hello, Sulika, ma'am. Dr. Sulika? She is perhaps disconnected. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Mm. Okay, Tulika, you have your presentation also, now. Would you like to? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please, uh, uh, do you have a PPT to share? I have a PPT. Yes, I have a PPT to okay. share. Okay, I'm, I'm making you co-host. That way you will be in a position to share your screen, right? Okay, yes. Thank you. Introduce yourself also, right, Tulika? And then make your presentation. <coughs> And I uh, request the participants to listen carefully and they can ask some question to Tulika also. Yes. Uh, Professor Miwako, uh, now uh, basically the questions which were related to your presentation are over. So as of now, now you are free. If you wish to join and listen some of the presentations, you are welcome. Otherwise, if you have other engagements, so you can. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing the, yeah. the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Akram, for this opportunity. Uh, I am Tulika, and I am uh, I work at Central University of Gujarat. I am assistant professor there uh, in the Economics Center. Um, so today I will be presenting on the um, uh, long-term care of elderly. So this is a presentation from one of my project um, that I did. And based on that, uh, this, uh, so this presentation is based on some of secondary data and some of the primary data from that project. So basically just to, um, uh, before that, Professor Akram, how much time do I have for the presentation? So Lika, you want five, six minutes or more than that, seven minutes? <laughs> Okay, six, seven minutes. I will try, will be try. I'll try to be quick. Eight minutes. So I'll just give a very, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so I will be very quick. So this, uh, Pati, this, uh, the first slide just gives a, gives us a, uh, uh, just a minute. Let me just start my watch so that I know. Um, yes. Yes, so this, um, the first slide gives us uh, the oldest dependency, dependency ratio scenario. So this is very evident uh, that all the, um, I mean, particularly India is uh, going through, uh, so shifting from the demographic dividend to silver dividend. So that means soon we are going to have a uh, larger old age population and particularly the concern is old of, older among old, which means uh, 65 plus population um, with, with the advancement of the health, the modern advanced technology, all that, uh, the 65 plus population will still be somewhat active, but the 70 plus population is going to be concerned uh, who will need a lot of uh, long-term care. When I say long-term care, basically it requires, um, it's the care which is needed uh, when uh, people are physically dependent. So there's two kinds of dependent financial financial dependence and the physical dependence. So this, the second slide basically shows a scenario uh, where the long-term care requirement is going to be acute. So the first column here, which says, uh, shows living alone. Yes. The first column here shows the living alone population. And as we see, uh, the rural population are 6.3% uh, of elderly are living in the rural area, which means the requirement is going to be huge. So these living alone elderly are totally dependent. They don't have that. Oh, was I not audible so far? Hello? Now you are audible. Now you are audible. Oh, okay, okay. So let me just go back. I'm so sorry. Just 30 seconds. Just 30 seconds back. Okay, okay. So um, so as I said, I'll be talking about long-term care in India. And uh, this uh, this particular presentation is part of my project that I did for ICSSR. 
And so I, I'll start with just a little bit of context uh, in terms of old age dependency ratio. So we know that we had this uh, phase of demographic dividend in India, but soon we will move to the silver dividend, um, and which means we will have more number of old age people and less number of people to give care. Uh, when we think about long-term care, basically we have to understand uh, the care which is uh, which needs to be given for like more than a month, three months, four months, or maybe like one year, two year, or maybe 10 year. And that kind of care requirement basically uh, is, uh, is required by the people who are suffering from chronic disease, non-communicable diseases, cancer, so on and so forth. So we also understand from the literature, health literature, that non-communicable diseases and chronic diseases are increasing a lot. And, and, and which means, and, and there is a strong correlation between age and non-communicable and chronic disease, which means as people will age, there will be more requirement for such kind of care. Uh, when I, when you look at this particular graph, this shows um, the pop dependency ratio given different kind of variants. But sixty, uh, but but in this uh, uh, this graph, there is one important aspect that older among old, which means seventy five plus population is. Good going to be a very important concern because of you know advanced health technology other things 65 plus population though they are old but yet uh, they are somewhat active so 75 plus population is going to be a major concern in terms of um, mm -hmm. long term care arrangement requirements now coming to the second slide because living arrangement is very important traditionally and still uh, so, till now, uh, we have a strong family system where family members are the main important care providers. Unlike developed countries who, who have been aging since long, uh, their institutional uh, they have institutional setup to provide care. India doesn't have that kind of care, so family members are like kind of a last resort to provide care to these people. So, in that context, the first column is very important to see because they will new they are totally dependent on the institutional care because they are living alone. So this is sixty as population who are living alone, of which more people are living alone in rural areas than in urban areas because we have reverse migration after the retirement. Now, the second uh, section, which is, uh, which is again going to require institutional attention is people who are living with their spouses. So people who are living with their spouses are somewhat of the similar age. If, if we also you know, consider five year as an as a average difference between the spouse, uh, which means these old people are providing providing uh, care to the to the other uh, come older older partner and and uh, i will also show you that there is huge psychological and physical burden of providing care which means there is a huge burnout uh, possibility uh, in this in this group who are providing care to their partners now those who are living with the children and um, uh, whether with the spouse or without a spouse have different kind of concern that is where we talk about the quality of the care because somewhat sometimes there is uh, reporting about uh, abuse of these old age people isolation of these old age people who are living with the family so they face different kind of concern though they have family to provide uh, care to them uh, so this is like uh, so this is a kind of matrix which we have to understand in terms of demand for long term care different people will demand different kind of long term care and uh, now i will just quickly move uh, this is uh, basically the adl and ideal uh, limitations basically as i discussed um, with you that uh, this is this these kind of i mean uh, these kind of diseases limits mobility of the people and they need uh, long term care so adl is basically activities of daily living, which means bathing, dressing, grooming, using toilet, eating, etc. And IADL is basically cooking, cleaning, transportation kind of activities for which they will be dependent on their family member or care provider. So as you see that as so after 65 plus, you see there's a sharp rise in the in this in this line, which means uh, there's a sharp increase in the demand for long term care after this. Uh, you can also see this uh, gray line shows helper, which means a helper in this helper here includes family member also, which means uh, there is a strong gap in terms of uh, availability of the helper to these family, these people who are in need of care. Okay. Now quickly moving to um, these uh, slides. So basically, I will not. Uh, this is this uh, the diagram basically shows uh, the dependency level, and you see rural female are fully dependent. So this is one very important uh, target group uh, to provide care, 
and again so rural urban female are fully dependent basically and uh, then uh, and 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 lesser number of male are fully dependent uh, okay uh, in terms of financial dependence the situation is same most of the time women are more dependent uh, than than the man uh, of course because in india labor force participation of women are lower than the man male so their dependency financial dependency is higher which means they don't have their own purchasing capacity uh, for the long term requirement or go to nursing home or purchase their health uh, health uh, services so which means they have lesser capability to purchase their own services now let's uh, quickly move to this part so this particular um, this particular uh, slide basically talks about the characteristics of the caregiver those who are providing care to these long term long term people so if you look at uh, this diagram here and it will again mix with the demand and supply of of the long term caregiving so you see female 69% of 69% of female one percent of women are providing ideal then the other line which is below which is very important here that 41% of care providers are working uh, and 39% uh, of ideal care provider are working again they are in the age and the age dynamics is very important that they are in the age group of 33 uh, sorry age group of um, majority of them are in age group group of 45 to 59 and 60 and above which means uh, the, the so a female um, those female who are providing care needs support in terms of providing care to their elderly member those who are working again they have double burden so they have to manage their office as well as they have to provide this kind of care and i also have uh, you know estimates which say which shows that it it is almost um, uh, three to four hours of care per day and again we also understand that this kind of care is not um, you know uh, fixed in a time so it is a very erratic demand and so those who are working uh, often become uh, very burdened with providing this kind of care again age as i have shown in the previous slide that uh, that even older people are providing care to their older more more older counter part and that is where the burn the chances of burnout is very uh, high which means they they themselves will become dependent soon and add to the uh, demand side of the long term care the third social aspect which is very important and i understand when japan was planning its long term it was very important for them because women as i said women 69 71% of women are providing care of which 50 and 50 almost 50 to 52% of daughter in laws are providing this kind of care so also um, so already um, we have lower female participation rate and with this kind of domestic duty uh, domestic Uh, kind of burden on only on the or mostly on the daughter in laws uh, limits their own uh, their own chances of participating into the labor market time for themselves time for their family so on and so forth as i have said that long term care requirement is not just for a month or two it is it is most of in most of the cases is it, it is for 5 years 6 year 10 years uh, or sometimes even more uh, as the life expectancy is increasing of the people um <clears throat> having said that um uh, okay uh, let me just quickly uh, show you the imp- uh, so this is this one i have already talked about that this is almost you know for iadl activities almost 5 hours a day uh, are needed to provide care uh, for adl again it is similar uh, uh, that is needed to provide the care um okay now this slide is important uh, because uh, the the care giving act as i said is very strenuous and it has a huge impact on the care providers and so if you look at uh, these these uh, conditions that is reported by the caregivers so most of them uh, have reported muscle and back pain fatigue is a very common thing hypertension frequent headache are the very common physical symptoms reported by the caregivers um okay i'll not uh, these are some of the pictures that i have taken about these old women when i was doing my field survey but i will just move uh, from from there uh, there is uh, there is one more uh, estimate that i have done um, which is not here is the impact on the uh, on the psychological health of the caregiver and most of the time anxiety is the most frequently reported uh, reported uh, reported uh, um, uh, 
problem by the caregivers. And that anxiety uh, it, it also comes from lack of information. So as I was asking about the cancer care, you know, so most of the time people who are suffering from chronic care, chronic disease, they suffer from multiple chronic disease. And they and that situation, they require multiple, uh, you know, multiple uh, sources, multiple types of doctors and clinics. And that is where in India, I, in my uh, field survey, I found that there is a lack of that kind of teamwork to provide such kind of care, which further is stressed among the caregivers. So uh, I think I will just end with this, uh, that uh, this matrix here, uh, that in case of India, the, the long-term care requirement is not very unified. So there is a division, there is a rural urban division, and there is a rich, poor, rich and poor division. So people, um, I mean, those who are rich and living, living in rural areas, they often have affordability, but they do not have facilities to buy. So they have to run to the urban center. So in that situation, we also need infrastructural development in the rural areas. Um, now coming to, the, uh, coming to the poor people, poor people who regardless of their rural or urban uh, setup, they actually lack their purchasing capacity. So for them, not only the infrastructural availability, but some kind of means tested policies are required so that they can purchase these kind of care for themselves. So I will just end with this. Um, thank you very much. And let, uh, please uh, let me know your comments or suggestions. To do this. Excellent presentation, Tulika. Uh, thank you. Thankful to you. you. You shared your findings and research. Uh, in a very lucid way. There was one quick question uh, coming to the yes. chat box, and that was related to your field area. Where did you conduct your field work, Tulika? Yeah, so it was it was in the six districts of uh, six states of India: Kerala, um, Gujarat, Odisha, uh, West Bengal, and uh, Uttar Pradesh, and uh, one more. What Gujarat? I already said, right? Um, what is the of India? Now that is wonderful. Now, basically, here yes. we can start the discussion afresh that what kind of differences you found in all these states. But I'm sorry, I will not ask you this question as of now, but sometimes we will come back to this topic, right? Sure, sure. Because sure. Otherwise, it will uh, consume plenty of time. So yes, I understand. Question, Professor Miwako from Tulika. I thank you very much, wonderful presentation. And I found, uh, uh, you know, I expected as well. So, uh, so maybe the second or third slide, uh, you compare the, uh, the, the living alone in rural area and urban area. I thought in urban area, people live alone and rural area, the elder people live together with their children or support, but it was not. So in rural area, uh, the percentage of the uh, the people living alone is higher than urban areas. So why? And also, if you have some explanation or tendency, could you please explain more? Yes, yes. Actually, uh, in India, rural urban migration, so migration from rural to urban is very high. And the characteristics of migration is uh, the urban, uh, sorry, the youth male. So it is most of the time yeah, youth male who migrate to the urban areas for work. And when they get older, so then when people retire, they, they go back to their rural areas. So that is why we have um, higher number of living alone people in the rural areas than in the urban areas. Uh, because they go uh, to the urban center for jobs, after retirement, they come back and live alone. So because then their children will go or stay in the urban areas uh, for the job. So that is why. Thank you okay. very much. And another question is a long-term healthcare services. So, yes. so like, like uh, you know, long term care service. Are there any, you know, who who pay for that the long term care? So as I told you in Japan, we implement the long term care insurance system from 2000 and people pay premium to the municipality and the municipality um itself um uh, has a role to distribute the uh the you know, the, the expense of the long-term care. Yes. So, 
So if you can see this um, slide here, I have actually looked at all these, I mean, developed countries who have long-term care policies uh, already in place. But in case of India, we don't have long-term care <laughs> policy in place um, because most often, um, so far, this was a thinking that family members will provide the care. But now there's more and more research which is showing that, that there are two concerns. A, not many people are living with the family because of you know, migration and other issues, uh, international, not only domestic migration, but international migration also. Um, uh, and secondly, the quality of care in the family. So because of two reasons, there now there is more demand for the long-term care. But still, uh, we don't have those kind of arrangement. It is most of the time personally bought so which means people will hire caretakers. So those who can afford, they hire caretakers. Those who cannot afford, they either stay with their family or their relatives or the neighbors will help them uh, manage their situation. Mm -hmm. So, so far we don't have any policy in place. Mm -hmm. So for example, the hiring the care worker is expensive or yes, yes. affordable? <laughs> Yes, yes, it is very, very, very expensive and very, very, expensive. Um, very, very expensive. And in my service, it is only very, you know, very rich people can buy uh, care, care, caregivers, more care, uh, care providers. In my experience, what I have seen, what families do, uh, when there is a spike of event, when like suppose elderly have fall sick, they have to do lots of hospital vis visits, or they are into the end of life care. Then what they do, they will hire domestic helps who will take care of other work like washing, cleaning, cooking, kind of thing. And the personal work of that member will be done by the family member, their son, daughter-in-law, or daughters. Uh, so because that is cheaper, you know, domestic help is cheaper than the healthcare provider, uh, than the long-term care provider, or, or like compounders or nurses. So those kind of arrangements middle class families are making uh, very rich of course can hire but poor they are totally dependent or vulnerable rather so like i can show you this uh, graph this uh, picture very quickly uh, you know here that's what i have i mean i have captured here so this person is basically he's a widower and uh, he was working as a guard and now retired so his uh, they live in a um, nearby urban city uh, his son works there and his village is uh, 10 uh, no, 20 kilometers away from the city what this person uh, do or does he uh, every day morning he gets breakfast and um, and then he comes to his village and he stays there whole day and sits here and there. So he's, he was sitting on the roadside waiting for the bus bus in the evening. And in the evening, uh, then he again returns by the public bus to his son's place. You know, so this kind of situation is there. While on the contrary, I have this couple here who were living in the city. And uh, they, this gentleman was a businessman. So this is from Gujarat, actually. And uh, he has... Uh, he has worked in um, he, in Kerala. So after retirement, he had a visit in Kerala. After retirement, he came to Gujarat. So he, his son lives nearby, but he stays alone. He has his own flat, stays alone with his wife. And, uh, you know, they have uh, care providers, auto walas, I mean, car walas to take them from one place to other place for their physiotherapy and all that. So it is, you know, you have to be really very rich to have this kind of life. Otherwise, this kind of dependency is there. So there is really huge divide um, that we have to understand. Mm. Yes. Hey, I have Thank five you very names. Much. Very ah, Thank you. Uh, I have five names basically listed by the candidates for making presentation. So who else is here to make a presentation? Tazivan is. Okay, now, uh, thank you, Tulika. Thank you very much for making a wonderful presentation and making our lectures and tutorials alive. Thank you. I hope we will find another opportunity to learn more from your research and your fantastic. Right. Thank you, sir. As if, do you thank have you. a PPT? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm making you co host so that you can share. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, is my slide visible, sir? Yes, 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 yes. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tehzeeb Anis, a research scholar, Department of Sociology, Aligarh Muslim University. And my research area is sociology. And currently, I am uh, doing research on um, child delivery practices and medicalization. But today, I am going to present on the topic over medicalization of pregnancy and childbirth. So, uh, over medicalization. Uh, before moving to over medicalization, I would like to give a brief introduction of medicalization. What basically medicalization is. So, Peter Conard, an American uh, medical sociologist, have written a lot about medicalization. According to him, medicalization can be defined as a process by which non-medical problems become defined and treated as medical medical problems, usually in terms of illness and disorder. It basically refers to the increasing influence of medical institutions and the medical professions on aspects of air of life that previously have not been considered as a medical issue. Like for example, uh, disruptive behavior by children, which is considered as attention deficit disorder with drugs being prescri prescribed for its treatment. Obesity, drug addiction, child abuse, etc. were earlier a moral matter, but today it is defined as illness for which people need uh, help rather than treatment. Not only Conard, but many other sociologists have also talked about medicalization. Um, <clears throat> medicalization. Like Ivan Illich, Irwin Zola, uh, Michel Foucault. Ivan Illich, who talk about heterogenesis, which means doctor causes illness. Michel Foucault, in his uh, book, The Birth of the Clinic, have also talked about medicalization, um, where he talk about medical gaze through which uh, sick are represented as object for surveillance. Now, when we talk about pregnancy and childbirth, it has become increasingly influenced by medical technology. And now medical intervention is the new norm in pregnancy and childbirth. Until the 17th century, birth in almost every part of the world was a female domestic arena and hospital was birth was uncommon. But during the 20th century, uh, pregnancy and childbirth are not viewed as natural event. This medicalization of birth is considered as a boon as it has reduced the maternal and infant mortal, uh, mortality around the globe. But this medicalization is not always a boon. It becomes a ban when it overstepped its proper boundaries. Now, pregnancy and childbirth are not viewed as natural event, but as a medical event. Uh, this means the increased rate of screening and monitoring of pregnancy to reduce the risk of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality have led to the over, uh, over medicalization of pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, if we say in other words, it seems the risk associated with pregnancy and childbirth are magnified and therefore increasing the cons concern of women regarding themselves and their new needs. Now, expecting trouble has become the hallmark of prenatal care leading to an exaggerated concern in women. And this had led uh, medical interventions during pregnancy and childbirth in the increased rate of cesarean section deliveries. Routine use of electro electronic fetal monitoring via ultrasounds, routine active management of care, and use of episiotomies without indications have increased. Medical interventions are currently overused in low risk pregnancy and childbirth, which has led to over testings during pregnancy and up. Trend, upward trend in cesarean section and in turn increase medical units. Actually, I have not included some of the reports uh, here, but I would like to talk about it. Uh, World Health Organization in its uh, guidelines regarding uh, cesarean section have said that the ideal rate for cesarean section is 10 to 15% only. But nowadays, the rate of cesarean section in almost every part of the world has increased, including India. If we see the latest report of uh, National Family Health Survey, Five, the rate of cesarean section is 21.5%, while it was 17.2% in uh, NFHS4, that is in the year 2015 and 16. So basically, um, the consequences of over-medicalization is that it has increased, increased the um, uh, rate of cesarean section and overuse of uh, medical interventions in pregnancy and childbirth. So thank you. Okay, Tazi. Yes, yes, sir. This was my presentation. Oh, very good. Uh, Thank you, sir. Very good one. And yes, uh, if Professor Bivako wants to make any comment on this 
or anybody else no that is not bad. yeah thank you very much such a interesting uh presentation yeah i i really agree with you uh the medical realization is covered all you know the human uh life event like uh birth and uh, to death However, we need, I think we need to consider the level of medicalization, you know, minimum um, and affordable intervention of medical, you know, the uh, technology is sometimes very necessary. So remember, I showed uh, uh, the infant mortality rate in the world and the average is almost the nine out of 1,000 in Japan. Um, so the mortality rate is two out of 1,000. And India, uh, I remember the 36 or 38. So um, it is, uh, you know, the scientific fact that the one-tenth of the infant cannot live without any medical treatment. So this is the data from the scientific um, research. So um, without any medical intervention, um, baby cannot live. So um, affordable and adequate medical intervention I, I believe the adequate and the, the affordable medical intervention is necessary to protect the health of a child and the mother. So to just to exaggerate the medicalization is not good enough. Or you should um, think what type of medicalization is not uh, you know, the benefit for people and what type of medicalization is um yeah yeah good or not so yeah please um articulate the phenomena and you 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 see the uh the you know the reality so not only you see not only the theoretical um uh, perspective but at the same time you see Please see the reality, and maybe it's better to make some kind of the you know the interview to the, the, the medical doctor and the mothers or midwives. So maybe you will find some you know the more um, you know explore explore you know the appropriate explanation about. And this matter. So that is my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So thank you very much, Professor Miwako, for giving those excellent comments on the presentation made by Tahzeeb. We have the problems of over medicalization, we have the problems of under medicalization. Now, one particular comment I would like to make here that in India, actually, something happening, uh, which but perhaps not much noticed by the rest of the world, that the percentage of the cesarean section deliveries is increasing very fast. Uh, unfortunately, the NFHS data is showing, and then uh, our own research is showing this, that in some of the private hospitals, 90% uh, to 100% of the births are actually the cesarean section deliveries, which goes... Hey, that is kind of terrible. Unacceptable. Very. Yes. Yes, uh, in India and in several states, the private sector is performing almost 90% to 100% deliveries as a cesarean section delivery. We have it much. is unnatural. <laughs> this is unnatural. That is why I'm. That is why we are talking about this over medicalization. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a paper that is published in one of the very prestigious journal in India, that is Economic and Political Weekly. I'll share that paper with you, Professor Miwako. Rather, you were the examiner of the thesis of that student also. Uh, you may remember. Nadia Muzaffar, she worked on this particular area, right? So there is a huge problem of over medicalization and what not else under regulation also. This is something which is also related to the under regulation by the 
policies or the government machinery also. So there are so many things where we can uh, make new intervention over a period of time. But yes, mm -hmm. it's so yeah. If so, you you should show the number. I uh, pardon. I think yeah, it is very problem problematic and very important. So that that you know the doctor uh, professor Agram's statement is very important and problematic. So if you can you know. Uh, show that data, like uh, nine percent or almost nine percent or one hundred percent of the private hospital um, conduct the C section. So it is unnatural. Nice. And if you compare to the, the, the other country, like uh, international comparison, pay attention how it is not uh, appropriate a procedure for the pregnant women. And maybe the policy policymaker and the media, you know, the mass media also um, pay attention to that, uh, you know, this uh, kind of the very um, imbalanced um, uh, treatment for the pregnant women. Okay, yes, truly pointed out by you. And there are three participants who are ready with their presentations. Iram, then Umar, then uh, Ifat, right? So uh, uh, do you, Umar, you are the next presenter. Do you have a PPT with you? Uh, yes, sir, good afternoon. So yes, sir, I have a PPT. Okay, I'm making you co-host, right? Uh, just share your screen after that and make your presentation, right? All yes, sir. All are excellent. We need plenty of time, but yes, we cannot include all these today. So maybe tomorrow onwards also will continue this presentation part, right? We are learning so many things. Umar, I have made you post. You yes, know. sir. Yes. Uh, hello, a very good afternoon, ma'am, respected faculty members. I am Umar Khan from the Department of Sociology, and today I am going to present on the role of ICT in healthcare system in India. <clears throat> India has a population of nearly about uh, close to 1.3 billion people, and in India, we are improving uh, accessibility to healthcare is one of the most priority. And the information and communication technology has the potential to transform the whole healthcare system in India. So for that, we should have to understand that what is ICT. So ICT is a diverse set of technological tools, resources. It includes internet, websites, blogs, emails. It includes webcasting, postcast, videos, and a telephonic conversations or a computer pre-recorded telephonic conversation that were used in a <coughs> health sector. So I just want to introduce some of the the digital initiatives by the government of India that were introduced in the healthcare sector. So the one is the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission that was recently launched by the government of India in September 2021. So that the Ayushman Bharat Digital Missions aim to develop a backbone. It was like a whole structure of framework that tried to support and integrate all the digital initiatives and infrastructures that government wanted to use and to intervene to promote the healthcare system and to bridging the existing gap. So the components of Ayushman Bharat digital missions are Abha number, Abha number is a, a unified health interference, healthcare professional registry, Abha mobile app and health facility registry. So Abha number is basically Ayushman Bharat health account. It's a unique health ID 14 digit number that were given to a particular person who wants to register on an online portal. This helps in allowing the receive your digital lab report, prescription, diagnosis seamlessly from verified health professionals. As of now, 32 crore people have registered them on ABHA number were issued to them. And the other one is unified health <clears throat> interface. The unified health interface helps the patients and other participants, applicants for a variety of healthcare services that it includes uh, 
the health service provider to make an appointment booking, teleconsultations with the patients and many other uh, health related issue were get discussed on a end user basis that every individual can assist to their particular doctor and make teleconsultation with them. The other is health facility registry. Health facility registry is a, it's a comprehensive uh, single path for the health facilities to make their to show their present uh, presence <coughs> there it includes both public and private health facilities that they include hospital clinic diagnostic centers laboratories engineering centers and any many more so presently as of now there are so many registered health facilities that were registered on that portal the other is abha mobile app it's a personal health record for instance if any individual who themselves uh, have their records on their personal mobile app and other who have they author authorized and permitted someone other to access their information in a private or secure confidential environment, then he or she can easily avail and get access to that data. Other is healthcare professional registry. And that on, the, on that platform, the professionals get registered. Uh, any healthcare professional get registered there and include doctor from different uh, systems of medicine either it was homeopathic doctor so the unani medicine doctor or uh, biomedical doctor or uh, allopathic doctor as of now 140,802 healthcare professionals registered on their platforms i would like to <clears throat> also introduce some of other e health and telemedicine interventions that the government of india work on it was national health Portal. National Health Portal is, is a health portal with an objective that creates an awareness of, amongst the citizens about health. It's a government program and service health sector. National Health Portal work currently <clears throat> work on a six regional languages, and it's a voice portal through a toll-free number and a mobile app. So it means when a government uh, introduce a toll-free number, it simply means that somehow the digit gap that was created by the digital divide in India. So it was a gapping of a digital device. So someone who is not having a multimedia phone can also avail that kinds of facility using the toll-free number. The other portals include e-hospitals. This is a complete uh, management system where the records of the hospitals, especially in government sectors, like patient care, laboratory services, workflow balance documentation, everything were available there. The other very much important uh, system is the online registration system, ORS. So the government used this system for the uh, make for making an appointment for the payment of fees in a government hospitals. For instance, many hospitals, there were a huge ruckus of crowd was there and many of the people were unable to make the appointment like in Ames, Delhi and many other health and uh, hospitals. So that it, ORS help in easing that thing and taking online registrations, appointment and payment of fees. The other uh, is the Mera Aspatal. That was a payment patient a feedback application where the patient can make a feedback of the service they have received or not received. They also rate the facilities and the quality of service provided to them in a healthcare system. Other two was the Central Drug Standard Control Organization. It will also act as a single window for all the industry regulators and citizens who want <clears throat> to work, enable online submissions of applications, grants and approval of online mainly medicines, clinical trial, and also for vaccines and the cosmetics. The other one is the National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization. In order to promote the organ donation among the citizens at large, National <clears throat> Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization Though its web portal offer the service to register someone who wanted to register themselves for organ donation and for other who was need a need of a transplantations and many more. So there are basically some of the challenges that uh, the government should have. Government is facing there is a lack of the adequate ICT infrastructure. That is all about the digital divide in India because not many of the people have access to the internet. So that's why government is trying. To make ease and introduce some of the Grahak Seva Kendra that's customer service centers where any individual from a rural place can easily get the use from these apps. 
the privacy and security is one of the challenges and awareness and education among the people is also needed for the utilization of this technology based initiatives that were introduced by the government of india thank you very much ma'am for this very good umair yes ict is playing very important role in creating an inclusive healthcare system and these are the uh, positive roles of ict very informative presentation thank you very much for this thank and uh, now we are facing basically crisis or a shortage of time because now there are many presenters with ready so without basically taking up questions we go to the next presenter right nusrat are you there do you need uh, do you have a ppt presentation nusrat yes sir okay i'm making you close so that you can share okay sir why this is not it is remaining no no that is not any dekhiye unko wahan se yahan se banega nusrat ko banaiye thank you sir am i audible yes Uh, okay uh, good afternoon faculty members uh, i am nusrat firdos from sociology department of amu aligarh uh, today i am presenting on traditional medicines and health seeking behavior among tribes and just we have a quick brief note on traditional medicine that traditional medicines also known as indigenous medicines or folk medicines sorry <laughs> sir uh, is it visible sir yes it is visible okay okay sir traditional medicines also known as indigenous medicine are folk medicines and comprises medical aspects of traditional knowledge that developed over generations within the folk beliefs of various societies including indigenous peoples before the era of modern medicine The World Health Organization defined traditional medicine as the sum total of the knowledge, skills, and practices based on the theories, beliefs, and experiences indigenous to different cultures, whether it is explicable or not, and used in the maintenance of health as well as in the prevention, diagnosis, improvement, and the treatment of physical as well as mental illness. And the traditional medical system are ever present but underreported channels of healthcare. in remote sir unserviceable and less changed situation these systems provide major health care although even were better alternatives biomedicines are available people continue to make use of these systems folk medicine indigenous medicines and tribal medicines complementary and alternative medicines these popular medicines have particular names so these systems easily identified and also in anthropological uh, literature traditional medicines traditional medicines in india has codified systems ayurveda yunani system yunani, yunani siddha and homeopathy as well as non codified system folk medicines in codified system of traditional medicines knowledge has been codified in the form of ancient scriptures and in non codified system of folk medicines mostly developed in local needs and resources to local people therefore the traditional medicines actually differ from one place to another and one region to another is given different names like folklore medicines ethno medicines bio medicines indigenous medicines, etc it is very important to preserve the traditional medicines and they are also need to non codified ancient knowledge have proper documentation to preserve 
these systems also have supporters and along with the facing against critics because uh, people don't have systematic knowledge about these systems and mostly scientists ignores that these systems by labeling them superstitious and consequently very little is known about their actual potentials the basic difference between both these medicines that biomedicines and traditional medicines is acquiring knowledge and it can be said that the traditional medicines acquire knowledge through experience while biomedicines acquire it, to, it through experiments and what is health seeking behavior then health seeking behavior is defined as an any activity undertaken by the individuals who perceive them to have a healthy problem or to be ill for purpose of finding an appropriate remedy it is also influenced by people perception of their own understanding of health understanding the pattern of healthcare seeking behavior could help public health practitioners and policy makers to improve the healthcare system and health promotion strategies in the social sciences health seeking is as seen as a process starting with the identification of the ailment in the domestic domain when a person is unable to fulfill the normal functions of everyday life the illness experience gains legitimacy and treatment through a process of deliberation and choice involving people in the immediate surrounding like family friends etc before help from the medical and non medical expert is sought strategies for resort by individuals are shaped by several consideration including cultural habits and predispositions uh, following factors are barrier of health seeking behavior among tribes like uh, lack of awareness infrastructures and inaccessibility of health care fear of losing dear daily earnings by the accompanying of persons and ineffectiveness of allopathic medicines and need to travel long distance absence or inconvenient transport facilities and also a uh, major uh, barrier is that religious misinterpretation and the socio economic constraints and women's restricted movements larger family size illiteracy and shyness in gynecological problem Uh, the tribal people in parallel with the treatment of by traditional medicines also adopt allopathic medicines because they do not completely put down their modern values and uh, totally accept the modern values and put down their traditional values uh, they are in a uh, parallel sort of things the uh, de degree of autonomy that one exercises in making choices uh, relating to the treatment of diseases uh, diseases among tribal groups is often related to some advice based on the experiential knowledge of elders and some senior members of the family this is even more among women folk and especially in areas related to sexual and reproductive health the kind of social network also determines the health seeking behavior among people there's a group of people who believe that the traditional system is better will resort to the traditional and in contrast a group that believes in the modern system resort to the modern the shift in the socio economic spheres of life also have impacted the traditional and ethnomedicinal practices of the tribals in the state of losing the traditional practices and the inability to adopt modern practices have created potential confusion among the tribal population the inhabitant of the tribal areas are the reservoir of accumulated traditional knowledge related to medicinal plants but due to the invasion of modernization knowledge about the use of herbal medicines wealth is vanishing at an alarming rate thank you sir very good nasrat yes in india we have a uh, medical pluralism we have different systems of medicine basically government of india is having a separate ministry of ayush so we are having basically at the union government level we have a ministry of health and family care and then we have a ministry of ayush and this ayush is basically alternative system of medicine that is ayurveda yoga yunani siddha and homeopathy so in india culturally we are accepting this uh, concept of medical pluralism very much and that is getting reflected everywhere and along with that we have the ethnic medicine right so nusrat is trying to look at this ethnic medicine concept also the uh, ethnic communities level ethnic communities are basically the tribal communities uh, these are identified as tribal communities also in india so um, uh, nusrat we will not be in a position to make comments on this but you made a good presentation please keep on uh, we are looking forward for your uh, primary data uh, i i hope that I, maybe next time we will get an opportunity to to see your primary data also right okay uh, then then we go to dr iram uh yes uh, i am audible sir yes iram you are audible do you have a kiram kiram yes sir 
Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm just making you co host. I'm having so, the PPT for the presentation. Okay. I'm making you co host so that you can uh, share a screen. Okay, sir. Just a second. Now you can share your screen. Uh, just a minute, sir. Yes, it is visible now. Yes, it is visible. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, sir. So just I'm going to uh, talk about uh, as we have known, we had talked about the number of topics of uh, related to the health. So first of all, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Rira Maslam, Assistant Professor in Department of Home Science. And I'm going to give a lecture or a, give a presentation on health promoting attributes of millets. So we have talked about many times about the health and health. Um, there are different parameters of health. Now, how we can improve our health? We can improve our health by taking a good nutrition. Nutrition is the process in which the digestion, absorption, assimilation, and uh, ex excretion has been taking places. So how we take the nutrition? We take the nutrition from our food. Uh, basically, we don't need medicine if we take a good nutritive diet. So I just want to tell you about one of the most important uh, cereal grain that is the millet that is having very much health promoting attributes in our life. If we include these uh, grains in our daily life, we definitely can keep away ourselves from the medicines and many health issues also. So first of all, I just want to introduce about the millets. So millets are the small uh, round shaped porous grain, which is an indigenous crop that complete impressive nutritive, pro, uh, nutritive profile. Then uh, we can say that um, all millet varieties belong to the posi family. The, however, they are different in color, appearance, and taste. Millets are nutritious comprising sorghum, pearl millet, finger millet, major millets, little kodo, porso, banyard millet. They are the minor millets. Next, there are the different types of millet that we mostly include in the winter season also in our diet, like sorghum millet, jar. Pearl millet, bajra, finger millet, ragi, or nutni, banyard millet, sanva, corso millet, chena, foxtail millet, kangani, little millet, kutki, amaranth millet, rajgira, or cholai, buckwheat millet, that is kutu, and kodo millet, that is kodon. Next, there are different health benefits of in consuming these millets. Why we should, should include the millets in our diet? Because millets manage the sugar level keeps our sugar level low, it raises the immunity, it, uh, they are the richest sources of antioxidant, they support the weight loss, and consume the millets for reducing their weight, repairing the body tissues as they are the good sources of fiber, they are having the cancer healing uh, ability because they are alkalizing and nutrients, then they are good for cardiac uh, health, because they are good sources of fiber, celiac disease, most of the person are suffering from the celiac disease that they are not allowed to consume the gluten, uh, wheat, they, that uh, wheat are the good sources of gluten. So they are, doctors suggest them to take the gluten-free diet. So in that, uh, uh, these millets are, all these millets are gluten-free. So we can consume these millets for um, uh, for celiac disease. Then it improves the digestion also because they are good in fibers. Uh, when we talk about the millets, they are the good sources of protein. They are a good sources, richest sources of calcium, that is ragi, bajra. They are a good sources of vitamin B, that is jar. They are good sources of iron, that is bajra. And then phosphorus, that is little millets. Here are the nutrients. Nutritional content of 100 gram of dry grain. As we can see in this table that the foxtail millet has the richest source of the protein that is 12.3 gram in per 100 gram of millet. That when we talk about the calcium, we can see that the finger millet is the good sources of calcium uh, that is known as the ragi that is 344 gram of calcium are present in 
100 gram of uh, ragi. So we can consume these millets in our daily diet diet also. So health benefits of sorghum that is jowar that it helps in preventing cancer, great for digestive health, it helps in controlling diabetes, diabetes, it helps in improving the bone health, it boosts circulation, it is a great for enhancing energy level, great for relieving gluten energy, improve heart health, it improves preventing cancer. Here are some nutritious or we can say mouth watering recipes of jowar that we can make the millets, we can use the millets in different forms that we can prepare the sorghum dosa, that is jowar dosa, roti, samosa, khichuri, idli, biscuit, peda, eggless cake, vermicelli, upma, and bagarbadi. So only millets are not, are, you know, we can say that are, they are the tasteless, they are having very much of nutritive values and we can include them in number of varieties in our diet. So the next one is your bajra. Bajra is used for, it is your help. Uh, help introducing the cholesterol, promoting the bone health, beneficial in treating the stomach ulcer, then promotes the heart health also. It's aid in weight loss. We can prepare the number of recipes from the bajra also, like uh, uh, pal millet, that is bajra upma, pakoda, halwa, khichuri. We can make the pal millet with or without jag jaggery, the roti, methi puris and pearl millet laddus also as we can consume as we are consuming in winters in many homes we, uh, the people are consuming this now next one is the finger millet that is known as ragi ragi is the richest source of calcium as i had told you earlier so it helps to reduce the blood glucose level it having the antimicrobial property promotes the bone health revives skin and hair health repair injured muscles tissue or all, all these so we can prepare different kind of recipe like finger millet, blood dough, vermicelli, kheer, cake, soup, dosa, instant, idli, and cookies. Next one is the kangni that is known as kakum. kakum. So it is help, uh, it help in proper functioning of the nervous system. It helps maintaining the bone and muscle health, so good for cardiac health, good for skin and hair growth, improves immunity. We can use in different forms uh, the foxtail millet, like we can uh, prepare the dosa, chila, chapati, breads, cookies, and pancakes also. We can make the foxtail millet chicken biryani or veg biryani. We can make the dhokla, we can make the kheer, we can make the cutlet, coconut rice, mango rice different forms then next one is the amaranth that is known as ramdana or also known as cholai so these uh, cholai ladoos are very much uh, familiar uh, in day-to-day uh, -day life so people consuming this because uh, they are helping decreasing blood cholesterol level stimulate the immune system reduce the risk of osteoporosis reduce the anemia anti-allergic and antioxidant properties also uh, we can prepare the amaranth chikki, laddu, chikki, porridge, and amaranth leaves and potato soup. Next one is the buck millet, millet that is known as kuttu. So we can uh, include the kuttu. Many uh, uh, the people when fasting, they only eat the kuttus, atta only, uh, uh, the chapati of the kuttu. So help in lose weight. It helps in lowering the blood pressure improving the cardiovascular health, having low glycemic index, helping improving blood pressure. So there are a number of millets uh, we, we can see here that Sanva. Now uh, come on to the conclusion. We have all heard the old saying that you are what you eat. And it's, it's still true. A balanced nutritive diet in the is the mantra to good health. So in recent times, people are becoming conscious of the consumption of balanced and nutritional diet leading to a healthy lifestyle. So millet grains have been the traditional component of the food basket. So why not include it in the daily diet? Eat right and stay healthy. So one simple way of including millets in our daily diet is the converting the normal wheat flour into a multi-grain flour by mixing 50% of your choice flour and 50% of the whole 50% uh, uh, of your choice millet and 50% of your whole wheat. Now, these are the some recipe that I had uh, prepared in my home as well as in my uh, department for um, um, for my students like laddu this is the barfi of the bajra Cholai laddu, then finger millet laddus, and sorghum that is jar namki. Thank you so much. Eat healthy and stay healthy. Thank you very much, Dr. Iram. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, 
presentation very informative very relatable thank you, thank you, sir. and uh, basically uh, very useful from our uh, day to day life very also delicious. and <laughs> and dr swalin is saying that very delicious also <laughs> <laughs> mouth watering kind of presentation it was uh, thank you, sir. Uh, 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 i have one request right can you share the pdf of your slides to the group for the larger benefit of the participants <laughs> and i would like to request i would like to make this request to all the participants who made their presentations can you share the pdf of your slides for the larger benefit of the participants that will depend upon your uh, wishes or your uh, will yes, if you sir. share the pdf version please share right now yes sir, sir definitely i i can i share it on your whatsapp group yes 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 i want you to share in the whatsapp group okay thank you sir i will uh, definitely share it um, in few time okay thank you right, sir right right so now uh, we have ifat ifat will make yes, sir. are you there ifat yes sir okay are you here with uh, the ppt yes sir i have ppt okay everybody is well prepared see ma'am how sincere students are here okay if uh, uh, let me make you co host so that you can uh, make the okay sir just a second yes. yes you can make now is my slide visible sir yes yes if so uh, uh, let me introduce myself my name is ifat jahazar i am a research scholar from department of sociology aligarh muslim university the uh, today's presentation is on burden of out of pocket expenditure on outpatient care in india so this uh, 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 this presentation is basically from secondary data so as we know india has the mixed uh, healthcare system where both public and private sector provide services so understanding the cost of care associated with different kinds of healthcare providers in, is necessary according to oecd health statistics 2014 india ranks well below the oecd average regarding per capita health expenditure that is oecd uh, 3484 us dollar and india is spending uh, only 157 us dollar however the national health account estimates for 2018 uh, shows that there has been an in increase in the share of government health expenditure in total uh, uh, gross domestic product of india it has increased from 1.15% in 2013 to 1.28% in 2018 however in graph uh, it has shown that uh, we have uh, in 2017 1.35 and after that uh, we have seen a slightly decrease in 2018 it has uh, also observed that the per capita government spending on healthcare has increased since 2013 to 14 that is rupees 1042 to rupees 1815 in 2018 whereas out of pocket expenditure as percentage of total health expenditure has declined substantially from 64.2% to 48.2% and 
पर कैपिटल आउट ऑफ पॉकेट एक्सपेंडिचर इन कंट्री हैज डिक्रीज फ्रॉम रुपीज टू थाउजेंड थ्री हंड्रेड सिक्सटी सिक्स टू रुपीज टू थाउजेंड वन हंड्रेड फिफ्टी फाइव करेंटली वन ऑफ द फैक्टर्स एट्रीब्यूटिंग टू दिस डिक्लाइन इज द इंक्रीज इन यूटिलाइजेशन एंड रिड्यूस्ड कॉस्ट ऑफ सर्विसेज इन गवर्नमेंट हेल्थ फैसिलिटीज इन कीपिंग विद वन ऑफ द पॉलिसीज रिकमेंडेशन ऑफ नेशनल हेल्थ पॉलिसी ट्वेंटी सेवनटीन द गवर्नमेंट इज फोकसिंग ऑन प्राइमरी health expenditure it has increased from 51.1% in 2013 to 55.2% in 2018 and other uh, reports like national sample survey office report titled health in india uh, 75th round which provide data on household social consumption expenditure related to health shows that percentage of treated spouses of uh, ailment by public sector is 29.4% which is 32.5% in rural and 26.2% in urban india this result shows that the overall a uh, share of public sector in outpatient care increased from 71st round data that is 24.8% regardless of the increase in the share of public sector still two thirds sought the private sector including private doctor clinic and hospital for outpatient care despite of increase in the share of primary health care out of 20 major states of india five states shows decrease in share of public sector facilities in outpatient care that is assam jharkhand punjab uttarakhand uttar pradesh which in result increase in average medical expenditure of outpatient in private sector according to national sample survey office report uh, the average medical expenditure for outpatient care per treated spell of ailment is rupees 519 90 and rupees 710 in rural and urban india respectively according to mukhopadhyay et al in their working paper titled analysis of household expenditure on health from primary data of 75th and 71st round of survey by national sample survey office reveals that on average mean about 5.5% of household consumption expenditure is spent on health out of which 2.9% is on out of pocket uh, uh, uh is on outpatient care and 2.7% is on hospitalization in rural areas around 5.8% is spent on health in which 3% and 2.7% respectively on outpatient care and hospitalization care in urban areas the share of uh, uh household consumption expenditure is 5% slightly lower than in rural areas around 2.6% is spent on outpatient care and 2.5% is on inpatient care thus outpatient care remains the bigger part of health care consumption uh, health household uh, consumption expenditure compared to hospitalization care the cons- uh, the cost of outpatient care must be primary concern as india progress towards universal health coverage because treat main cost incurred on elements not requiring hospitalization is also a substantial burden on poor population and lack of financial protection for outpatient care pushes millions into poverty if outpatient expenses occur for household with higher frequency the cumulative amount for a whole year may not be as low as to be ignored therefore the government must regulate the medicine and diagnostic prices and cover outpatient treatment in their schemes thank you so thank you ifat can you hear me am i audible okay mm-hmm. i'm unmuted uh, professor mio okay am i audible hi uh, yes uh thank you very much for the wonderful presentation dr ifat azhar you are know, as out of pocket expenditure is a you know, serious mm-hmm. problem and uh, basically the uh, the many every you know the medical profit procedure should be covered by the insurance or and uh, uh, the because health care is one of the essential human rights so yeah i really admire your effort to 
to make a research on these issues. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your further you know, the, the contribution to this area. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Definitely, ma'am. Thank you. And now, uh, do we have any other presentation? No, I think we don't have any You're muted. You're muted, please. Uh, am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. Okay, fine, fine. Thank you very much for making a very good presentation. And uh, please do keep in mind the kind of comments made by Professor Mivaku. Uh, I can see that. Professor Mivaku has asked uh, one query from Nusrat. So, Nusrat, are you here to answer the query made by Professor Mivaku? Excuse me, I I'm, I'm cannot hear you clearly. Can you please repeat again? No, no, no. I didn't ask any question to you, ma'am. I asked Nusrat because you had written a question to Nusrat. So, if she is here, she can reply to are you here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, perhaps she is not listening us. So, okay. Uh, we, uh, Nusrat is here. Nusrat, can you, uh, do you want to reply to that question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please. I will just try to uh, make one highlight mm -hmm. that, that uh, yes, uh, oh the tribal people still practice traditional medicines uh, i uh, i actually focus on major tribes of jammu and kashmir uh, that uh, gujar and bakarwal they are practicing in their day to day life but as we know that transhuman people uh, face challenges to access uh, these facilities at high altitude but uh, according to my research that local women are age old women have a great belief in indigenous medicines but as we know that uh, social that their lifestyles and uh, their the shift we have seen in the uh, tribal people as in gujar bakarwal or in any other tribe the um, we, many shifts have been seen in the socio-economic and in other aspects or in other spheres of life. It clearly have impacted on the traditional and ethno-medicinal practices of the tribal. Uh, uh, more, uh, the younger generation still not uh, interested in uh, these practices. They are because uh, the educational and the socio-economic uh, spheres are very uh, great in uh, as comparatively to other tribals uh, uh, in Gujar and Bakawal and in Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, the age-old women still practice these traditional medicines uh, uh, to certain um, uh, diseases. Like uh, I have also collected in my uh, research work. Uh, in my field work that uh, the uh, ethno medicines or herbs are related the uh, herbs they have used in uh, common illnesses they are they are only uh, used in postnatal care period or in uh, related to obstetric or a gynecologically problem they are not used it in a common way in a common illnesses so uh, it's is it uh, we have seen that uh, it's a tremendous change. We have seen that younger generation not inclined towards traditional medicines, but in uh, old age women are in old age uh, people are still inclined towards. They have a massive uh, belief on traditional medicines. So uh, thank you very much. So so uh, it is interesting in India such kind of the traditional medicine does not have you know the does not attract people anymore however like a uh, european union and the united states like a uh, national institute of health nih has a great interest of the such a uh, traditional medicine and complementary and alternative medicine so i 
really very interested in you know making a you know the collaborative research between some you know the West, western uh, the researcher in western country and you for like uh, mike sachs uh, the vice president of international sociological association rc15 maybe uh professor akram knows him very well and he is the specialist of the sociology of health and he's uh, uh, many um, uh, publication on the complementary and alternative medicine and traditional medicine in China and Japan and some other Asian countries. So, yeah, um, yeah, it might be <laughs> very, yeah, interesting to make a uh, yeah, you know collaborative work. And uh, this era is, I think, very promising. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Miyamoto, for making those comments. Uh, yes, sir, you are working on a very uh, interesting and important area. We have one last presentation by Dr. Farah. So, Dr. Farah, are you there? Dr. Farah? Farah? Uh, can you hear us? Maybe connectivity related problem. He just mentioned that yes, I am ready with presentation. Just a few more seconds to respond. Uh, Dr. Fah, are you here? Farah Ashra? Uh, perhaps she is no longer connected, maybe some connectivity issue. So now we can close our session for today. It was a very good session right from 10 a.m. Right, we had one lecture by Professor Miwako Hosuda and then another lecture by me. And then we got to know so many things from the participants. We had very good presentations from Dr. Tulika, Dr. Iram, then Tahzeeb, Umar, Ifat, and Nusrat, right? And all these presentations have definitely enriched, enriched the learning experiences of all the participants. You know, one of the purpose of incorporating these presentations is this, that the other participants who are in the early stages of their research or who are basically not doing any kind of research, doing your their uh, undergraduation or post-graduation courses, they may learn a lot. They may understand how to prepare a PPT presentation, how to deliver a lecture in an on online platform. All these purposes are uh, there, right? And this makes the learning more interactive. And basically, Gyan is looking forward to make these learnings interactive so that that it should not remain another form of uh, one way communication which generally takes place in a traditional classroom learning right so thank you very much to the participants and yes to the foreign faculty for giving that much time sharing her knowledge understanding empirical uh, experiences insights and what not else right your your presence has kept the sessions alive now, there's one very important information that I want to share with the participants. Tomorrow, we will have two lectures from Professor Mivaku Hosoda. And because of her personal engagements, she will not remain available for the next classes, right? Because initially, we agreed to have this number of classes. So we tried to put all the classes in the first four days so that she remain available for all the classes here, right? So any participant who is interested in asking any question 
to Professor Miwako Hosoda. Tomorrow will be a big opportunity for him or her, right? So keep your questions ready. If you want to ask any question related to your research, anything about Japan or about any of the topic that we have discussed till now, you keep your question ready. Tomorrow we will make the tutorials more productive and fruitful. And yes, uh, I think that will be a very difficult moment for me also, but that will be, uh, that we will see tomorrow. This journey has been going very well. I'm enjoying the company of all the participants and definitely Professor Mivakosuda. And I would like to share one more information with the participants. Basically, we met there in Toronto, Canada, during the International Sociological Association Conference. So uh, we do join some of the international platforms and those platforms are available to all the participants. If you want to meet Professor Miwako Hosoda in person, you need to join some of those platforms, join the International Sociological Association, join the APSA, Asia Pacific Sociological Association, and there are several other organizations and associations. That way we learn, right? That way we, we interact with people. And when we talk about social capital, this is one of the fantastic way to basically enhance your social capital, right? So don't just read about social capital, try to improve your social capital also. Yes, so with these words, I would like to say thank you to, uh, again, participants, Samiwako, Dr. Swalehi, our co-coordinator, who is sitting here and who is taking plenty of uh, time in making the notes and all these things and basically said, uh, taking care of the organizational part of this program. So we will meet tomorrow again. Thank you very much. Please uh, close. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Yes. Yeah,